Yeah, I think so. Let's get started. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this event and thank you for attending. My name is Isaac Farhadian. I'm an AP US government and economics teacher at Pittman. Before beginning, I'd like to review some guidelines. Please silence your cell phones and refrain from using them during the presentation. So if you have them, please put them away. Uh, we have a brochure outlining today's agenda. So please take a look at it when you get a chance. I'd like to extend my gratitude to the TUSD Technology Department. They're up there. So why don't we give them a shout out for putting this event together. Thank you. I also want to give a shout out to Alice Stessman. Alice Stessman, why don't you stand up for knitting some peace sign R bands that resemble the ones from the famous Supreme Court case. There are some students wearing them right now. So shout out to her. Additionally, I'd like to note that we have over 220 students from various grade levels and social studies courses in attendance. We are thrilled to have you all with us today. Our keynote speaker is Ms. Mary Beth Tinker, a free speech activist who has made a significant impact in the field of free speech. Today's event is an opportunity for all of us to gain insights into the importance of free speech, how it shapes our society and what we can do to protect it. To introduce her, I'd like to invite two students, Tiana Carr, Fiona Sarkisian, who are both junior state of America officers to the podium to read her biography. After they read her biography, she will give a presentation to you and there will be an opportunity later to ask her a question during the Q&A session. So really quickly, uh, during the Q&A session, uh, if you have a question, you can come up to one of these mics, state your name, state your grade, and then you can state your question. Give me a thumbs up if you got that. Okay, cool. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Tiana. Mary Beth Tinker was born in 1952 and grew up in Iowa, where her father was a Methodist minister. Her parents believed that religious ideals should be put into action, and the whole family became involved in the civil rights movement in 1960. Most students don't want to be suspended when they get to algebra class, but that's exactly what happened to Mary Beth Tinker in eighth grade at Warren Harding Junior High School in 1965. Her crime? wearing an armband to mourn for the death in the Vietnam War. Four other students in the Des Moines, Iowa School District were also suspended, but the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, challenged the suspension in court, saying that the students had a First Amendment right to express themselves. The students' actions land led to the landmark Supreme Court ruling in Tinker v. Des Moines that neither teachers nor students that shed, quote, shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression to the schoolhouse gate. After the court victory, Mary Beth became a registered nurse and nurse practitioner, working mostly with children and teenagers. She holds master's degrees in nursing and public health. Mary Beth continues to educate young people about their rights, speaking frequently to student groups across the country. In 2000, the Marshall Brennan Project at Washington College of Law at American University named its annual Youth Advocacy Toward Award after Mary Beth. Mary Beth currently lives in Washington, but speaks virtually with students throughout the country on a Tinker tour to promote civics education and the rights of people. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now honored to welcome Miss Mary Beth Tinker. Please give her a warm round of applause. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Fiona and Tiana and Mr. Verhadian and Mrs. Freeman and Mr. Mercado and everyone who had a part in making this assembly possible. I am so happy to be with all of you. I'm here in Washington, DC, and we are going to be talking about my favorite subject, you, yes, you students, are you out there? What do you think? Do you have your rights? Come on, let's hear it. Do you have rights? Yeah. First Amendment rights, we're going to be talking about especially because this case, which was decided in 1969, over 50 years ago, and it's still having an effect today, amazingly, it based itself on the First Amendment and the 14th Amendment. So the rights of the First Amendment, the right to freedom of speech, sound familiar? 
Come on, let's hear it for freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, people. Yes. How about free press? Yeah, free press. Freedom of assembly, what we're doing right now. And how about the freedom of religion, which is a two for one special. The right to have your own religion, which is the free expression clause. And then there's the establishment clause, which says that the government cannot establish what your religion is going to be. So that's the freedom of religion. And then the freedom to petition, which only 2% of Americans know about. And that means basically, if you see something unfair or that you don't agree with, you have a right to do something about it. So that's what this case is about. The First Amendment, the 14th Amendment has to do with equal protection under the law. And the 14th Amendment is also why the states have to follow the First Amendment. It's called the Incorporation Clause. But anyway, I didn't know about all those rights when I was growing up in Iowa. And this case became something that was unexpected in my life. And I'm glad that it was an experience that I had because it has to do with you and with young people having a say. And to me, that's very important. It was decided over 50 years ago by seven to two. It was a very strong decision at the Supreme Court by Justice Abe Fortas saying that neither students or teachers leave their constitutional right to expression when they enter the schoolhouse gate. And one of my favorite parts of the ruling is that students are persons. Yeah, that's kind of good. Students are persons under our constitution with the rights and responsibilities of persons. So it was a very good ruling for what education should be in a democracy. And it's so important because why? Because for you to speak up and use your rights, as it turns out, is good for you. It's good for your health. It's good for your social health, your emotional health, your physical health, all of it. Being a nurse, having worked mostly with kids, I think that's really important. So it turns out when you can advocate for yourselves, what would make your life better? What would you make you happier? What would make life work better for you as a kid, as a teenager? Turns out that's better for everyone because a society that listens to its kids, to its young people and implements your ideas for what would make your life better. That's a stronger society. That's a better society. And when you're cheated from expressing yourselves and your, your needs and wants and what would work for you, that's bad for society. So it's good for you to speak up. It's good for you and it's good for the society. <clears throat> and one of the reasons why young people have always been on the forefront of speaking up for fairness, for justice, for a better world is because at your developmental stage as teenagers, you are perfect for doing that. You even have more dopamine in your brains, not dope, dopamine, a neurotransmitter that makes you more likely to take risk and take action. And so there's something about your developmental stage and even your brain chemistry that makes you want to speak up and stand up. But when you get put down and censored, you can get discouraged and, and upset and frustrated. And so that's why it's important for you to know your rights and use them because your rights are like your muscles. And if you don't use them, you could lose them. So yeah, it's good to use your rights and know them. And today we're talking about the first amendment, but we could talk about other rights, like the right not to be strip searched in public school. That was another case not too long ago, I think in 2007, Savannah Redding was in eighth grade when she was strip searched and accused of having ibuprofen in her pocket. And that went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, actually we're not going to be strip searching our students in public school. And there are other cases we could talk about uh, having to do with other amendments and other rights. But today we're focused on the first amendment. Does this make sense students? Is there life out there? So far so good? 
Yeah, okay, good. Well, I didn't know about all this when I was growing up in Iowa. That's me and my little sister. She's so cute. And John, my older brother. Well, our father was a minister, as the girl said. And my father believed, and my mother too, that you should put your ideas into action. If you believe in a more loving, kind world where we care about each other, and that's basically the basis of all religions, Let's see some action. What are you doing with your life to make that happen? Don't just talk, talk, talk all the time. Let's see some action. So when the swimming pool in town where we lived, it was Atlantic, Iowa, and I was five years old. And it was 1957, the year an amazing group of young people spoke up and stood up in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah, that was the Little Rock Nine, desegregating the public schools. The same year, up in Iowa, this swimming pool would not allow black families in our town. And it was 1957 and the kids from the church said, that's not very fair, that's not loving, let's do something about it. And they took action as young people like you tend to do. And so they went up to the swimming pool and they said, that's not fair, that should change. Well, they asked my dad to go with them and he did. The people at the swimming pool said, well, you know, that's too bad. That's the way it's always been. I hate when people say that. Well, eventually it did get changed though because the kids didn't give up and they kept speaking up and they changed that policy. Now anyone can swim there. But it didn't just happen. It happened because people spoke up. As a result though, people in town, some people got really mad at my dad. And they said, you're not supposed to be doing things like that. You're supposed to be preaching on Sunday. And my dad was like, well, I can't separate my life like that. I have to you know, live my, my values. And so he got fired from the church and we lost our house. It was part of the job at the church and we had to move. And that's how we ended up moving to Des Moines, Iowa when I was five years old and I started kindergarten in Des Moines. But that's how I was raised. You're supposed to speak up and use your voices to change things that need change. And I found out that it's a good way of life to do that. Well, up in Iowa, thanks to the free press, we saw the most amazing kids on the news. It was 1963 now, and I was 10 years old that spring, right around this time of year, in the Birmingham Children's Crusade marched and protested racial discrimination. In Birmingham, 2,000 black students rallied and sang freedom songs like this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. And they got out there and they were using their first amendment rights to speak up and change things that needed change. They couldn't swim in their swimming pool either. They couldn't go to the library. Their parents couldn't get the jobs that the white parents did and, and live in the houses that others did. So Martin Luther King was in jail, writing his famous letter from Birmingham jail. And the kids said, well, that's okay. We're gonna get out and we are going to speak up and rally. And that's exactly what they did. And I thought, we all thought they were amazing because we saw them on the news and news of these kids' actions went viral all over the world. The great democracy and how it's treating its little children and it's black families and not just black families, but other disrespected groups, Latinos, Native Americans, Asian Americans. And the news of this went around the world because of the bravery of the children. But some people didn't like it, the white supremacists. The white supremacists got really mad that students did their action in May of 1963. In August was the March on Washington where thousands of people rallied in Washington and Martin Luther King gave his famous, I have a dream speech. That was in August. By September, the white supremacists were really, really mad. And this is the KKK. We know the white supremacists are still around, of course, but now they usually don't dress like this. Now they wear jeans and t-shirts, you know, suits and ties, dresses, skirts. But that year, the KKK, the white supremacists, they developed a very cruel plan to punish the Birmingham children and they bombed their headquarters. 
the 16th Street Baptist Church there in Birmingham. On Sunday morning, September 15th, knowing the kids would be in Sunday school and church. I had just turned 11 years old when someone came by our picnic that day up in Des Moines that we were having and told us what had happened to the brave children of the Birmingham campaign and how the bodies of four little girls had been found in the rubble after the bombing. Cynthia, Addie Mae, Carol, and Denise. These girls were 11 to 14 years old, about the same ages as me and my sisters. We were so sad and angry when we heard about this. This Tinker case is about you being able to express all your feelings, not just the happy feelings that some adults like to hear about, no, all your feelings, the full range of human emotion, grief, sadness, anger, depression, frustration, anxiety, whatever it is. And we felt all those feelings when we heard about what had been done to the Birmingham children. But then we heard about a plan to take some action. And I found out that action always helps you deal with sad feelings and strong feelings. And there was a plan that was put out by the writer James Baldwin to wear black armbands all over the country and to have memorial services to mourn for the little girls who had been murdered by the white supremacists. And so that's exactly what we did in Des Moines, Iowa. That's me in the middle and over to the right, my sisters, Bonnie and Hope, and to the left, Phyllis and Linda with our black armbands, which is a symbol that goes way back through history to mourn for the dead and to say something without using words. And I'm so glad that so many of you are wearing your black armbands today because yes, we have messages that need to be expressed today also, for sure. Well, that was the first time we heard about black armbands, but we didn't wear them to school that year. And the next year was an amazing year also in our history for young people speaking up and standing up for justice, for fairness. It was called Mississippi Freedom Summer, 1964. That year, 700 college students were called to Mississippi by these heroes of our country. Fannie Lou Hamer, she had already been beaten and jailed for trying to register to vote. And over to the right, Ella Baker, what a woman. She started a group called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So these two women and a man named Robert Moses, they called college students to come to Mississippi this summer and help us register black voters because they were being terrorized by the violence of the white supremacists in counties that were majority African-American and non-white. There were maybe two or 3% of voters registered to vote because they knew they could even be killed if they dared to try to register to vote. So the students with their courage, they sang freedom songs and they hopped on their buses because they had to train first. So they got on their buses and they sang freedom and they went off to Mississippi and they knew they would be in great danger because the white supremacists were threatening, if any of you students come here, you won't leave alive. And, the students went on anyway. By the way, these violent white supremacists do have a flag to represent their views, as we know. It's the Confederate flag, which explains why it's so emotional even today. But the students were brave and they were willing to risk their lives and they went off to Mississippi and immediately three of them were kidnapped and murdered. Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, they had gone to investigate the bombing of a black church. That was a favorite tactic of the Ku Klux Klan and, and, the, and the White Citizens Council. And so these three disappeared. The events of this summer in Mississippi Freedom Summer led to the standard for free speech in public schools today. And I'll tell you how that happened. Because after these three disappeared, their bodies were finally found that August, August 4th, 1964, at the end of the summer. And when school started that September, some high school students in Mississippi, black high school students, 
They decided to protest the murders of the three young men by wearing these buttons to school. They said, one man, one vote, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating. And they were told, no, 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 you can't wear those to school. That's way too controversial for school. So they said, we have to talk about these things. This is our lives that are being affected. And so they started a court case. And the court case is called Burnside versus Byers. It went to the appeals court for Mississippi, which is the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. There are 13 appeals courts in the United States. Their case went to the Mississippi Appeals Court, the Fifth Circuit, where the judges said a couple years later that they should have been allowed to wear those buttons to school to express their free speech. And why? Because they did not substantially disrupt school. That standard and that case would later be quoted in the Tinker ruling at the Supreme Court. But this is called a precedent case. When cases like this happen in the lower courts and then other cases build on them and refer to them, those are precedent cases. And this is the precedent case for the Tinker versus Des Moines case that established your free speech rights in public school today. Goes back to voting rights and students speaking up for racial justice. Well, there was a call that went out all over the country, please, to the clergy, please clergy, ministers, priests, rabbis, imit, whatever, come to Mississippi this summer so these people aren't murdered more. And my parents heard about all this and they went to Mississippi that summer and they came home on my 12th birthday. They said, we can't just preach about love and understanding. We have to actually stand with these people who are risking their lives to make it real on earth. So they came home on my 12th birthday and they told us, but they believed that we should know what's going on in the world. Now, some people throughout the country are trying to stop you from learning about these things or trying to stop students, I should say, from learning about these things. They think you can't take it, it's too upsetting. But talking to students all over the country, I hear that you, you do want the truth. You do want to know about the history of our country. Oh, by the way, here's the guys that murdered the three young men. This is their trial. They're having a good old time. They're laughing, chewing tobacco. They know nothing's going to happen to them. They can kill any black person they feel like. Probably any non-white person too. And they can kill any white college student who comes down to help register them to vote. They know it's going to be okay. The jury was all white. The judge was all, the judge was white. It would take a later Supreme Court case to say that you can't kick someone off a jury just because they're not white. But at this time, no, it's no problem. They knew they can do whatever they feel like. And here's the deputy sheriff and the sheriff. They were in on the murders also. They're waiting for the verdict. They're not too worried. They know it's gonna be okay. In the end, nine of these guys did actually do some jail time, two to nine years for the murders of the three young men. And yeah, you can watch movies about this. It's called Mississippi Burning. And there are other movies about these important events in our history that led to your free speech rights in public school. At the end of the summer, the Civil Rights Act was passed saying that you cannot discriminate in public places like restaurants and hotels. And then the next year, the Voting Rights Act when the Voting Rights Act was passed, then millions of Black voters, Latino voters, Native American voters, anyone who was, could finally register to vote without the great fear of violence, intimidation, and harassment that they had been facing. The Voting Rights Act said that the states that had been harassing people for registering to vote, from now on, they were going to have to check with Congress before they made any voting rights laws. And by the way, since you're studying these things, in 2013, the Voting Rights Act was weakened at the Supreme Court, which said, hey, you know, we're kind of past all that problem now. So these states that had to check with Congress, they don't have to do that anymore. Immediately, about 800 polling stations closed in those states. And people in Congress said, wait a minute now, we need a strong Voting Rights Act again. And so that's what they're doing right now. Some people in Congress are trying to get a strong Voting Rights Act now again because it was weakened 
in 2013 in a case called Shelby County. But anyway, I wanted to tell you that because voting rights was at the center of struggles for student free speech rights. Okay, I wanna tell you one more thing. This is amazing. You won't believe this, but the same day that the bodies were discovered finally of the three young men, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman, August 4th, 1964, on the very same day off the coast of Vietnam, a US Navy ship claimed it was attacked, the USS Matic. It turns out it wasn't attacked. And here's an article from the US Naval Institute saying that the, it's clear now that high government officials distorted the facts and deceived the American public about events leading to the full involvement in the Vietnam War. The war was already going on, but it was under the radar of most Americans who didn't even know where Vietnam was. And they certainly didn't know the history of the country, that it had been a colony of the French and that the Vietnamese had a war of independence against the French, which they won in 1954. Most Americans knew none of that, but when they heard our Navy ship had been attacked, within days, Congress voted almost unanimously to start sending thousands more soldiers to Vietnam. It was called the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution and President Johnson signed it within days. So by Christmas time, here's what we were seeing on the news, war, 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 all the time, the Vietnam War. And by this time, my family was also involved with the Quakers, which is a religion all about peace. And my father also worked for the Quakers by this time. So we were learning more about the war all the time and we were seeing it on the news. It's called a war of atrocity because of all the horrible things that happened there. And us kids were getting more and more upset about this. It was mighty times like now. You are living in mighty times also. Some periods of history are more intense than others. We were living in one of those times and you are again today as a student pointed out to me recently. It's mighty times. Well, we were getting sadder and sadder about all this and it was Christmas time and my dad, you know, he would read to us from the Bible, the story of hope and love and forgiveness, the little baby in the manger and all that. People would send Christmas cards saying, you know, peace on earth. And we thought, yeah, why don't you adults try it sometime? Peace on earth and find a way to get along instead of fighting war all the time, violence. And so we heard about a plan to wear black armbands it was developed at Roosevelt High School with some of the students there. And the idea would be to wear black armbands, but to school this time. Not for the Birmingham children now, but for mourning the dead in Vietnam on both sides of the war and to call for a Christmas truce in the war so that the, sides, the two sides could negotiate. See, kids are so logical. We thought, why don't these people negotiate and stop killing each other all the time. And so we decided to wear black armbands and that's me with my mother and my dad behind and a, two of the teenagers, I think that's Ross Peterson and Chris Singer. We decided to wear black armbands to school, but when the principals heard about it, they made a rule against armbands. And they said, any student wearing an armband will be asked to take it off and then they will be suspended if they don't. Oh boy, then we had sort of a moral dilemma. Should we still do it? Should we not? Well, a group of us decided to go ahead and wear the black armaments. Although my dad, he didn't think we should. He said, you know, these principals have a hard time as it is. I'm sure Mrs. Freeman would agree with that. And he said, I don't know if you kids should be wearing those black armaments. Your principal said you shouldn't. But you see another of your qualities, young people, students, you're so persuasive. And so we said to our dad, wait, dad, you told us to speak up for our conscience and you even lost your job because of speaking up for what you believe in. And so we convinced our dad. Well, when the principals made their rule, Chris Eckhart also wore armband and five of us got suspended. We tried to change the school board's rule, but they would not change it, although several of the school board did vote in favor of us. 
And so we went to school, we got suspended. Some people got really, really mad at, at us for that. And here's a postcard we got with the hammer and sickle. That's the red hammer and sickle, which is a symbol of communism. And people would say, you're communist. But we said, no, we're not communists. We're Methodists. Come on. It was really confusing. And people got mad and threatened us. And someone threatened to kill me. And they threatened to blow up our house on Christmas Eve. It's really crazy. But here's someone who was really great and supported us, Lieutenant Corporal in the Marines, Harry Corey. He wrote a really nice letter to the editor saying, this is great hypocrisy. These kids should have their freedom of expression. And another group that supported us was the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, which has been around for about 100 years. And they are all about your rights. They go to the Supreme Court more than any organization in the United States. And they said, now this isn't fair. These kids didn't do anything. They weren't hurting anyone. They're just expressing their views about the war. And so they said, we're gonna have to go over to the other branch of government, the judicial branch, because your schools are in the legislative branch and we believe they just did something against the constitution. And so we're going to take this over to the judicial branch and have them check it. And that's how the checks and balances work for the three branches. So they went over to the courts, to the judicial branch, and they started a court case. And we lost at the district level of court. By the way, when you have a case that has to do with the Constitution, it'll be in federal court. So we lost at the district federal court. And then we lost at the appeals court. For Iowa, which is the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, well, over in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals in Mississippi, the students had won their case, the ones who protested the racist murders of the three young men. And so now you've got two appeals courts saying different things about the same subject. That's called a circuit split. So our young lawyer, Dan Johnston with the ACLU, he said, well, we're gonna have to appeal this to the Supreme Court and let them decide. The Supreme Court doesn't take very many cases though. They only take about 70 or 80 a year out of around 10,000. So I was really surprised when they took the case and I was really surprised when we won the case when I was a junior in high school and Justice Abe Fortas wrote the decision and he said that schools should not be enclaves of totalitarianism. And that some things we hear and talk about in life, yes, are going to make us uncomfortable at times, but that's a price we have to pay for education and for democracy. And they made their famous statement that neither students or teachers leave their rights when they enter the schoolhouse gate. But all rights have limits, yes, because other people have rights too, and we have to balance all of these together. So they said the limits on students' free speech in this case was going to be that number one, you cannot substantially disrupt school with your free speech. And for that, they cited the Burnside, Mississippi case. You can have your free speech as long as it doesn't substantially disrupt school. And number two, your free speech cannot impinge on the rights of others whatever that means. And that has been debated ever since. And we can talk about that. I grew up, I had no idea this case was going to be so important and that we would still be talking about it over 50 years later. I grew up, I became a nurse. Yeah, I wasn't really that happy. That's me the day after we won the case. I wasn't really that happy because why? The Vietnam War was raging. It was one of the worst years for the war. And now I'm happy because I see that the case affirmed your rights to speak up about things that matter to you. But I was still discouraged because the war was raging for some years even after that. Well, I became a nurse. I started working with kids and teenagers a lot. And I, got, I saw, wow, kids aren't getting a fair deal in our society. Guess who's most likely live in poverty? What age group? It's you teenagers and children. It's not because you don't work. It's because when your parents have you, they are more likely to live in poverty. The whole family is. I said, that's not fair. I was taking care of kids that were shot because I was a trauma nurse also. 
I was taking care of kids that had terrible asthma because they're breathing in polluted air from the, you know, polluters that weren't being controlled and regulated and let it, they could get away with whatever they felt like while the kids were having all kinds of breathing problems. And I was taking care of kids that had lead poisoning from the water they were drinking. Lead is a neurotoxin. It affects your brain for your whole life. And there was lead in the water because polluters were pouring toxins into the streams and creeks and the waters of our country. And they have been doing it for years and these things hurt kids. And I said, this is so unfair. Kids not having place to live, begging for money for their schools. It's not right. Kids are being disrespected. And so I started traveling around speaking with students all over the country. And here's one of my favorite stops back at my old junior high school, Warren Harding Junior High School, where I was suspended in eighth grade when I was 13 in 1965. But this time there was a big party and we had a big event in the auditorium and my brother John was there and we spoke at a number of schools in Des Moines and some students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas from Parkland in Florida came up from March for Our Lives and they helped us celebrate and they even dedicated a locker to me. So I have my own locker now at my old junior high school, it's number 319. And the superintendent of schools even wrote a letter to the editor for the newspaper. And he said, I'm so glad we lost that Tinker case because we really want our kids to have a say and to have a voice. So I'm going to wrap it up. I just want to tell you about a few cases really quickly that came after ours at the Supreme Court. After our case, there were three cases that cut back the, your rights in public school. And they're all ACLU cases. Bethel versus Frazier said that you cannot use your free speech for obscenity. Hazel versus, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmeyer said that if the speech, what you're saying is school sponsored, like a school newspaper, the administration has more right to censor you. However, 15 states, including California, have passed legislation saying, no, actually, we're going to give our kids the journalism rights. And they're not going to be censored in their journalism. So that's Hazelwood. And then Morris v. Frederick, which is also known as the Bong Hits for Jesus case, where the court said, you cannot advocate for illegal drugs with your free speech in school. Those are all ACLU cases. And the last one I want to tell you about was a victory for students' rights in public school. Mahanoy versus Brandy Levy. It was the summer before last. Brandy had basically cursed her cheerleading program on Snapchat. She was punished in school for doing that. The case went to court. She won at every level. It, she won at the local level, she, at the district level, she won at the appeals level for Pennsylvania, she was in Pennsylvania, and she won at the Supreme Court by eight to one. The only justice who voted against her was Clarence Thomas, but everyone knew he was gonna vote against her because he has said that he doesn't think students have free speech rights in public school. So everybody knew he was gonna vote against her, but that was Brandy Levy recently in 2021. So people, that is my story. And now let's hear from all of you. What do you think, students? Does it make sense? Good. Glad you thought it made some sense. Great. All right. Thank you, Ms. Tinker. So here's what we're going to be doing. Uh, if you have a question, we'd like for you to come from the side and come stand in front of these mics. State your name. State your grade. Ask your question. We have about uh, six minutes, a little over six minutes. And then after the Q&A, we'd like to take a big, nice group picture in front of the screen with Ms. Tinker in the background. Okay, so without further ado, if you have any questions, come on down, stand in front of this mic, and we'll have you go from there. And also, students, if you ever want to write to me, write to me at tinkertour at gmail, and I'll write you back. Yes, my dear, I see a brave person there. Hello, I'm Felix, I'm, I'm in the 12th grade. Uh, Hi, Felix. How do you think um, students like us can use our free speech to push against like 
recent state legislation has been trying to censor certain curriculum in school. Yes, like yes. Thank you, Felix, for raising that. It's terrible the way that states are passing legislation to censor you to ban books. There are something like 1,300 banned books now. And you can follow what books they are at the American Library Association and at PEN America, the Writers Union. But Felix, do you feel like there are things you can do? I say, you know, find out what's already going on and join up with others. Why start a new group? Maybe you could have a group in your school. Let's be, I know you're a senior, so you're not there too much longer. But when you get to college, or if you go to college, and you don't have to, by the way, this is gonna be an issue as an adult for you as well. So what, do you think there are things you can do to speak up? Um, I know that the first step is to always organize a certain like group or movement. I know um, certain clubs that are here in Pittman that can aid with that, but I'm just, yeah. I'm not sure like the exact steps to go forwards to exactly like establishing that sort of- um, Yeah, um, yeah, I say do a little research, find out what's going on what groups are speaking up against that kind of censorship? Like they tried to censor uh, AP African-American studies in Florida and that's going on all over the country. You know, see what groups are, are pushing back and speaking up about it. And then, you know, maybe you can uh, join in with one of those. It, it is an interesting good life. That's what I found out. And it should be, make it kind of fun too. You know, some parts of it can be kind of interesting, like students in Rhode Island, they spoke up against all the test, test, tests all the time. They dressed up like guinea pigs and rats at the legislature, you know, so maybe you can find what's going on already and join up with them. I'm so glad you're raising that. Just knowing about it and paying attention is, is part of the plan, and I'm glad you're already doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felix. Hi, um, my name is Callie Noriega and I'm a senior and my question for you was what was it like going to school after the decision was made and did faculty members treat you differently? Callie, it was crazy. The whole experience was completely crazy because we just did this little small thing and then it turned out to be a really big thing. So, um, I mean, at, so much happened that year that we went to the Supreme Court. We had just moved to a new city, a scary big city, St. Louis. And I was in 11th grade. And then also I decided, oh my gosh. I, so I became gay right around that time. So I was stressed about a lot of things. And then, oh, it's time to go to the Supreme Court. So I was kind of stressed. That's why I always tell kids, find ways to decrease that stress, people, and do it in healthy ways. Um, but yeah, so then we won, and I was so amazed that we won and surprised, because who thinks, you know, kids are going to prevail? But we did, and we won, and, and um, I, most people just ignored it in the school, in my school. Like the teacher, I would expect, I know if Mr. Farhadian, if one of you won a case at the Supreme Court today, he would talk about it tomorrow. But my teachers basically ignored it. I think they were in shock because you know people just didn't think the kids would win, I don't think. So that's kind of what happened. But but it was really kind of you know a stress to figure it out. And then to figure out now what to do with this experience, which we all have to figure that out. What are we going to do with our talents, our passions, our experiences to try to make a better world? So that took me some time to kind of figure out what am I supposed to do with this experience that was so crazy. Thank you, my dear. Are you speaking up about something? Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> no, you're not. But but yeah. I know you're thinking about things. You'll yeah. probably think about things to speak up and ways. There are so many different ways to speak up about things. Politics, music, art, so many different ways you can express your feelings for a better way of doing things. Are we gonna settle for the way things are now? No, no way. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you, my dear. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my name's Saviana and I'm a senior and I was just wondering what was going through your mind when you got suspended? Oh my gosh, Sobiana, I was just like, I was the most scared, nervous person you can imagine. Okay, so wait, you won't believe this. I was, I was sent down to the office by my teacher, Mr. Moberly, my math teacher. I got down there and the vice principal said, now Mary Beth, that's against the rules, so take off that armband. I looked around, I looked at him and I said, okay, Mr. Willis said, I took it all. 
I learned a very important lesson that day. You don't have to be the bravest person. You don't have to be, you know, so fearless. I was like scared, nervous. I even backed down, but you can still find a way to do something. So that was kind of what happened. But I was just thinking, oh my gosh, I am so scared and nervous. And I was the only, my friend Connie was like, you better take that off. That's against the rules. Wait, get this. The school allowed black armbands if you were mourning the death of school spirit. If not enough kids came to the football game, oh, that's okay. You can wear a black armband then. Yeah, but oh, no, no, talking about war. No, 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 that's not for you kids. That's why this is a youth rights issue, which is an international human rights issue. But thank you so much, my dear. And, and what are you doing? Are you speaking up about any specific thing you care about exactly? Um, no. Not right at the moment. I know you're going to be thinking about it, though. Thank well, you thank so you. much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, hi, my name is Brock. I was wondering, um, how would you encourage students who maybe feel fear when they yeah. talk about certain beliefs and um, ideas that they might have that differ from other students? Yes, I know. Communication skills are really important. We can't just sweep controversial things under the rug. We have to learn to talk about them with respect for others. I didn't learn communication skills till I was in nursing school. And there are various methods you can use. One's called Lara. Listen first. Listen to what they said. Then affirm that you heard them and that basically the idea is you don't think they're an idiot. Then you add on something, then you respond, but you first listen. So yeah, communication skills. I think we all have to practice those and I try to practice them also every day. I don't always succeed, but you don't wanna just start arguing with someone when they say something. So you kind of show respect for them that you heard what they said and that you, you, know, you may not agree with what they said, but you respect them as a human being. So I think that's part of the challenge. And then the more you do something, the easier it gets. Just to speak in front of a large group, I would never think I could do that when I was a kid, but slowly you do it more and more, it gets easier and easier. Is there something you wanna speak up about? No, I was just wondering. Just thinking about it. Awesome. Thank you. Let's Thank give you. a round of applause for Mrs. Tinker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me, everybody. It was great to be here and I hope Ms. you will Tinker, use the more rights. Second, we wanted to take a group picture in oh, front yeah, of the school with you. So guys, let's hey, come on down. You're welcome. Uh, grab your Thanks stuff. Students, behind photo you know, stand in front of the screen. Take let's a nice big picture. It. And then uh, that would be great. We'll go from there. And thanks for arranging all of this. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Okay, okay students, photo up. Let's do it. Free speech for students. <laughs> And students, write to me anytime. I'll write you back. Tinker tour at Gmail. I'll write to you if you write to me.
Goodbye. Goodbye, my friends. Thank you for setting this up. And I hope we can meet again one day. Okay, take care. Bye now.